Previously on Reviewing His Magic. Princess Celestia is a god of ponies. In fact, I think Twilight's the only one who hasn't blasphemed her name yet. She's definitely the Saint Michael of the group. You stay gay, pony girl. God loves the gay one. Just as so long as they don't do anything to break it by somehow denying that Princess Celestia is... Oh, thundering frig! And now, the exciting conclusion. Well, I guess God doesn't love the gay one. I mean, this doesn't look particularly omnipotent to me. So, Celestia's not God. Interesting. Makes me wonder what they set it up in the series for, though. But hey, it's not a total train wreck. This is still a good show, right? And I bet this episode's gonna be just fine. Right? Right? This season finale is a total mess, save for now the fact that it completely banjaxes my delightful headcanon. You know, the one predicated on a sweet theological allegory like C.S. Lewis's Narnia and such? But oh, who needs allusions to that artsy bunk? This is just a show for little kids, right? Yeah, okay, a show for little kids that generates stuff like this. All that for a little kid show, huh? Boy, you guys are freaks. Now, remember when I said, So leave a message if you want to talk about another good episode that makes you go, Dude, my little pony rocks, brah! Or better still, an episode that makes you think, This show is for little girls. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you, Exhibit B! And just in case, and on the off chance it hasn't already been made abundantly clear how I feel about it... I DON'T LIKE THIS EPISODE! IT IS A BAD EPISODE, AND YOU SHOULD FEEL BAD WHEN WATCHING IT! But oh, I certainly did! Ricky Gervais levels of unpleasantness potent enough to eject me bodily from the bronyhood for a day and a half? I'm not fooling. I mean, this is a deal breaker, right? It has to be. I mean, who could look at this two-parter and genuinely call it a peach cupcake? But oh no, saith the bronyhood. You. Bronies, you. Bronies, you friggin' more. <laughs> kid. Epic nurse! This made me cry tears of joy. Most beautiful episode ever. Oh, sweet Celestia, my little scratch has magenta eyes. Boo. Boo. Dude, calm down. Seriously. Hello? Who is that? Just me, dude. Chill. Brony curious? What are you doing here? Well, I am in the opening credits. Shh! You leave the fourth wall alone. You... Hang on. What do you want? I'm here to help! This Carolot wedding thing isn't nearly as bad as you think. What? No, really. You. Yes? Think that... A Cantalot wedding... Uh-huh. Is... Salvageable? No. It's not just salvageable, it's ingenious. <laughs> right. No, I'm serious. Sure, you who thinks the Nightmare Moon Saga was broken. Yep. 
You, who thinks that the Discord two-parter was lacking. Uh -huh. You, who thinks that all the episodes thus far focusing on big event-driven adventures instead of personal character studies are seriously flawed, thinks that a cantaloupe wedding is ingenious. It's true. <laughs> Your Honor, I object. Well, that's what I'm here for. Let's hash it out. Oh yeah, right. You want to see me cry? No, man. Let's end this. Oh yeah? Yeah! Well then let's do it right. I ain't got nothing better to do. The hell? Don't do that! There's no coming back from that! Well then I guess we'll dance together forever. In pony hell! No! No! Oh. oh, there we are. Right. Ha! Top that, Paleo. Are we ready? Please, take it away. Oh no. After you. Oh, alright then. Huh? <clears throat> Things I don't like about the Canterlot <laughs> Wedding <laughs> episode of My Little Pony. <laughs> Fim. <laughs> Dude! Number one. Who the heck are Cadence and Shining Armor? So everything is super in Equestria, the sun is shining, the birds are chirping, and the main six are enjoying a nice picnic. Suddenly Spike enters the scene to jumpstart the plot, as it happens that our frilly filly protagonists have been invited to a royal wedding at Canterlot Castle. Strangely though, they've also been hired to employ each of their unique talents for the wedding. It's soon revealed that this is so, because the wedding is between some pony named Princess Miyamori Cadenza and Twilight's ever-loving big brother and best friend forever, Shining Armor. Oh, you remember Shining Armor, don't you? Boy, I'd be hard-pressed to think of a single episode from the last two years Twilight spent in Ponyville where she didn't rave on about this amazing stallion. Ugh. How's that? Oh, nothing. Continue. Currently, five of our fine fillies and Spike are super stoked to participate in the noble nuptials. But on the fun train trip to Canterlot, Twilight seems a bit bummed out. She's not happy with the idea of her best friend marrying some pony she doesn't know on such short notice, and once at Canterlot, the first thing she does after getting Pinky's confetti sneeze out of her hair is march straight up to Shining Armor and tell him so. And it's here that we learn the most important fact of the entire series. Number 1.5, Twilight's brother is a dude. Uh... What? Dude, I love this guy! He's totally like the most relatable character in the whole show, man! Twily! Oh, brother. Shining Armor explains that he hasn't been in contact recently due to the fact that there's been an unspecified threat made against the city. And as he happens to be captain of the Royal Guard, Shining Armor's been busier than a bishop breakdancing. He invites Twilight to be his best mare at the wedding. <laughs> awesome. After showing her his great big purple party piece. Uh, that's a magical incantation that covers the whole city in a glowing force field. But, uh, you know, it's purple. It's a purple shield. Uh, Twilight is happy with this exposition, but still demands the lowdown on her mysterious wannabe sister-in-law. And that's when the handsome groom-to-be reveals that this Princess Mia More Cadenza person has been Princess Cadence the whole time. Oh, you remember Cadence, don't you? Boy, I'd be hard-pressed to think of a single episode from the last two years Twilight spent in Ponyville where she didn't rave on about this amazing mare. <sighs> how's that? Hmm? Nothing. I heard an exasperated huff. No, no. Go on. Hey, you're the one who says this episode's too hot to trot. So what's your beef? <sighs> Shining Armor and Princess Cadence are quite possibly the two biggest cop-outs the series has produced for the sake of convenience thus far. Aha. Conceptually, at least, both she and Shining Armor are total nonsense to the series. Shining Armor because the crux of his story is founded on the relationship that was never established, and Cadence because, well, what is Cadence? She's an alicorn. Why? Up to this point, the only two alicorns on the show were Celestia and Luna. The established mythology of the ruling sisters has been destroyed by the introduction of Cadence. Before now, one really never had to question why Celestia and Luna ruled over Equestria. They were the only alicorns and literally had power over night and day. Light and darkness. Yin and yang. They occupied this weird space between royalty and divinity, and their uniqueness made them a natural fit for the overarching monarchs of Equestria. Now that there are other alicorns, though, these all become important questions. Who put Luna and Celestia in charge as opposed to two other alicorns? Hell, why not Cadence? She's a princess too, right? It's never really shown that Cadence has any extreme powers, though. It certainly isn't implied that she can control the sun and the moon. Not to mention that from the looks of her in the present versus Twilight's flashback, Cadence ages like a normal pony, whereas Celestia and Luna are both baseline a thousand plus years old, and in all probability immortal. Are all alicorns that powerful? Or are Celestia and Luna like super alicorns or something? 
You see, boys and girls, the reason this is so flimsy is because Cadence had literally no reason to be an Alicorn. It does nothing to help her character, and instead just raises a ton of otherwise avoidable questions. She has nothing in common with the established Alicorn characters, and would have been just as competent a character as a normal unicorn. Add to the fact that Lauren Faust herself stated that she never had any intention for there being other Alicorn characters besides Celestia and Luna, and now we just have a big mess. As she is, Cadence exists a blotch on the canon of this universe, and that's to say nothing of the fact she is supposed to have a strong history with Twilight being her old bull sitter? Hey, what's wrong with that? She's a foreign princess, right? Who gets themselves child-minded by visiting royalty? Well, it is Twilight, Princess Celestia's best student. Really? Take a look. No cutie mark. This is all pre-faithful student. So why is Cadence doing this? Doesn't she have, like, important princess things to do? Did her parents take away her allowance or something? <laughs> Maybe she's just really civic-minded. I don't know. It just doesn't seem like something a princess would do. It feels more like a way to get Twilight to all of a sudden be okay with Shining Armor getting married. Or oh, perhaps it's just a contrivance to sell new playsets to nine-year-olds. That's very G3 of you, Hasbro. Well, I'm glad we agree then. This episode sucks. The end. See you next time, everypony. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. These things are huge problems. They're just nitpicks over the setup. With little polish, they could have been made to work perfectly fine. <sighs> Do tell. If Twilight didn't actually know who Cadence was, it would have made an even stronger point as to why she was so convinced that Cadence was actually evil, as well as why it was so hard for her friends to believe that she's actually onto something. As it currently stands, since Twilight had such a long-standing positive relationship with Cadence, she should be confused as to why Cadence is acting so mean, and want to talk to her and find out what the problem is, not vilify her. If Cadence was a stranger, though, her actions and assessments would be playing right into Twilight's already established penchant for paranoia, and, again, reinforcing her friend's reluctance to believe her. And as for Shining Armor, if he had a strained relationship with Twi, it would explain why she never mentioned him before this point. Problem solved! Boo. Oh, shut up. You know, none of this would be necessary if they just set these people up earlier in the season, right? I know. Remember the Grand Galloping Gala? The Triple G? Of course! Yeah, that was actually foreshadowed from the third episode into Season 1, so when we finally got there, it felt properly built up. But this time, crucial climactic plot elements like Big Brother's Best Friends Forever and what have you barely get a song at last minute? Yeah, a story fears better when it's begun with the end in mind. It shows that the writers are taking care to think about what should happen next, as opposed to just making it up as they go. Although... Speaking of the gala, did you find it weird that Rarity stressed herself out into oblivion trying to make all those dresses for her friends in the span of one day, but then it takes us another 12 episodes to actually go to the gala? She could have maybe spread that out a bit more, don't you think? Hey, you're already on thin ice, mister. Don't go and ruin season one for me as well. Love and tolerate? No. Anyway, so Twilight eventually confronts the cause of all our problems. But something's amiss with Cadence as she doesn't seem to recognize Twilight at all. Disgruntled, Twilight heads off to... <clears throat> What now? You skipped the thing, dude. The thing? Twilight first suspects Cadence when... I am aware of a certain schoolyard rhyme featured in this episode. When... And that a few members of the fandom find its manic dance-related antics amusing. Sunshine, sunshine. And that you might be tempted to try it if you're a complete idiot. It's sunshine, sunshine. Because it's so stupid. Ladybugs wake. <laughs> sunshine, sunshine. Ladybugs wake. wake. Clap your hooves and do a little shake! shake. <laughs> Urgh, I hate you! Awesome. So every pony sets about their task to prepare for the wedding, all the while Twilight observes more and more that nowadays, Princess Cadence is nothing like the pony from her youth. Though she can't seem to find any reason for it, this pony princess seems pretentious, dismissive, and two-faced. Twilight tells the five about it, but they count the odd behavior as wedding day jitters. Twilight considers this, but decides that she should at least consult her brother about it. But once at Shining Armor's place, Twilight witnesses her royal poshness pull some shifty moves, and the next day of rehearsal, she just up and declares Cadence evil in front of everyone. Okay, this is silly. Why didn't she talk to Princess Celestia first? Or maybe Princess Luna? Where is Luna? She's never in the same place at the same time as anyone else. Shh. Shush. We'll get there. At this, every pony is utterly aghast, and Shining Armor is furious. He explains that the stress of his responsibilities has been giving him terrible headaches that Cadence has been using her magic to try and heal. And that's what Twilight observed the previous night. Is it just me, or does he make it sound as though it'd be better if they simply postponed the wedding until later? You know, at least until the dire situation that requires a city-sized shield has passed? Mm, no. Every pony leaves in a huff, including Princess Celestia. And Twilight, crestfallen and shamefaced, tearfully apologizes to Cadence. To which Cadence responds by brutally murdering her by magical melting. The end! Hey! Knock it off! 
Well, that's what happens, as far as we know. This part ends with what looks like Twilight's horrible murder followed by cheerful credits. Isn't it just magical? Well, yeah. Ugh. Part 2 begins with Twilight trapped in the caves beneath Cantalot Castle. She lives! Here the villainous aristocrat starts a taunting Twilight that she's thoroughly owned, which may seem unnecessary considering that we last saw Twilight apologize to her. That is, until she starts her evil gloating about shining armor. Twilight is so incensed by this that she begins to madly bust down cave walls, which eventually unveils <gasps> the real Princess Cadence! Armed with nothing but lies, Twilight looks ready to kill her, but fortunately the real Princess Cadence can prove her identity. Sunshine, sunshine! Shut your flippin' face! They manage to claw their way out of the caves thanks to Twilight's Nightcrawler powers and make their way back to the Great Hall just in time to stop the wedding. Whoa, 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 slow down, man. You're forgetting something. Again. What? Only one of the best things about this arc. Wait, oh no, you don't mean, oh. This day is going to be perfect. No. What? This day Arya stunned me the first time I heard it. Like, I love the songs in Friendship is Magic, but this song took everything to a whole new level. This was some Golden Age Disney level atmosphere going Golden on here. Egg. The choreography was awesome. Choreography? The singing was amazing, and while it was a little ham fisted like Shining Armor's introduction, it gave us a glimpse at the real cadence, and we learned that she really does love Twilight's brother and is worthy of our care as an audience. Golden Age. Go what are you talking about? Dude, come on. The feels. Boo! Anyways, the two make it to the wedding just in the nick of time. Every pony is shocked by Twilight's interruption, except for fake Cadence, who seems to fail to realize that if Twilight escaped, then she'd probably bring the real Cadence with her, yeah? Fake Cadence is kind of an idiot. Well, you know, funny you should mention that. Number two, Fake Cadence is an idiot. Who then dramatically reveals herself as the evil, unnamed ruler of the Changelings, while Princess Celestia goes out for coffee. The Queen, later revealed as Queen Chrysalis, then begins to monologue about how she's been siphoning away love from Shining Armor, who himself is now under her direct control somehow, and her Changeling army is, right now, chipping away at his magical shield. Celestia returns from her coffee break in time to challenge Chrysalis directly, and promptly gets her omnipotent cheeks cosmically spanked. <sighs> I know, dude. There, there. There, there. Now, to give him some credit, Chrysalis actually seems surprised that she defeated the one and only Celestia. And who wouldn't be? I mean, who'd have thunk that the love of one star-crossed stallion had the power to neutralize a deity? However, if she wasn't sure that it would work, then we must assume that open battle with Princess Celestia was plan B. Right, so if that's the case, then what was plan A? I mean, what was she there to do? Well, maybe she meant to pretend to be Cadence permanently, and Chrysalis just pulled the invasion out of her plot at the last minute once Twilight blew her cover. So, plan A was to pretend to be Cadence forever. Well, that'd make sense if her army wasn't already attacking the shield as we speak. This invasion looks clearly premeditated, and especially given how mean Chrysalis has been to every pony up until now, she doesn't seem to really care about keeping a low profile. As Twilight observed, being an ass to every pony, even to the point of forcing poor Rarity to make frivolous changes to a dress she could care less about, doesn't really scream covert ops. And yet, open battle contradicts everything we're told about how the changelings roll. Uh, they're covert folk, right? Who will secretly eat your good vibrations? Hmm. Well then... Maybe it isn't just love that gives changelings strength, but just strong emotion in general. Oh, bollocks. We were told that these creatures feed on love, and to do that they'd have to sneak in and pretend. If they can consume any emotion, why don't they just bop in and start terrorizing every pony instantly? Emotional buffet! Well, it must be because Shining Armor had that massive energy shield around Canterlot. Chrysalis needed to get him out of the way so her army could uh, sneak in or invade. Well, he seems to be in her power now. Why doesn't she just order him to lower the shield? <laughs> Was this a mistake? And see, the shield itself is a problem because it's not explained why it's up in the first place. Oh, there was a threat made against the city, but by whom? We must assume that it was by Chrysalis. But Chrysalis is already inside the shield! She would have had to have threatened the city whilst inside the city and all by herself. <laughs> was that a mistake? And why would she be alone? She has an army that can look like anyone. So we're to understand that all on her own, Chrysalis sneaked into Cantalot to take down a shield that would never have been a problem if she hadn't sneaked into Cantalot. Unless, of course, the shield was already up before she got there. In which case, why doesn't her army just sneak in the way she did? 
Perhaps Chrysalis just sucks at planning. Well, I wonder what else sucks around here. Number three. Where the huh is Luna? One minute the illustrious Princess of Darkness is there to safeguard the nighttime, and then like that, she's gone. What the fudge? Did they really think we wouldn't notice? Dude, drop it. I, what? No, seriously. Princess Luna has her part to play. Just ignore it for now. I d ignore it? Uh-huh. Trust me. J you fine. The changelings break through and run amok. Queen Chrysalis just stands there and lets her enemies get away as the main six run for the elements, with not a second to notice that Shining Armor's finest have all gone on holiday. Not to be out embarrassed by this level of legendary incompetence, the fillies face their own battle beyond the might of any party cannon and find themselves dragged back to the Great Hall, rendering the entire scene narratively pointless. Hey, come on, man! The party cannon ruled! Party cannon ruled. Party cannon ruled! Party cannon ruled. And don't forget the TWILIGHT LASER GATLING GUN! Come on, dude. In what other context could you ever say you saw a pink pony use a unicorn as a magical-powered stationary weapon of lavender lasery death? Touché. Anyways, the ponies are captured once again, while the queen instructs her army to go and feed. On what they should feed, it isn't made clear, but since they start subjugating the citizens of Cantalot by force, we must assume that they've since developed a taste for hatred. Twilight attempts to free Cadence, and this time, just to shake things up, Chrysalis now employs the ancient and mystical changeling strategy known as just stand there and let your enemy get away, with releasing the captive white mage, who then proceeds to heal the guy who can cast the protection shield against her, though he would fail to do so but for the power of Cadence's love. And it's here we get this bunk. My power is useless now. I don't have the strength to repel them. My love will give you strength. <laughs> what a lovely but absolutely ridiculous sentiment. Ridiculous sentiment? Oh boy. So your entire race of Hoosits gained strength from the pilfered love of others, a method of attaining power you just utilized to vanquish Celestia, but when someone else tries the exact same thing right in front of you, it's a ridiculous sentiment? Okay, which leprous blobo monkey's responsible for this noise? Quick, someone dispatch the EPA to Hasbro. Halliburton's obviously been shale fracking nearby, and the gas has gotten to Studio B. Hello, is anyone still conscious? Ah! There was actually a double meaning in the song. The song is in the key of D flat major, just like winter wrap up. That means that the root chord is a D flat major chord. Usually an A flat major chord will lead into a D flat major. This is the 5 1 chord progression, and is also known as the authentic cadence. Now it seems to resolve to a sadder chord at the end of the phrase. Instead of ending on the D flat major around 1 minute 16, it lands on the B flat minor, the relative minor of the D flat major. Now when a chord progression seems to be heading to the root chord, but lands on the relative minor instead, that is called a deceptive cadence. Uh, uh... Whoa. <laughs> That's ingenious! Maybe they should give the story to the sound guy! Uh, yeah! <laughs> awesome! Don't look now, somebody's being entertained! Well, okay, that was kinda cool. But you know, it doesn't rescue the resolution to this story, which only wraps up because Chrysalis is a demonstrable idiot. Hmm. Maybe. Maybe? Give me a break, everything she does is nonsense! And what is with this weird message the show ends with? Weird message? Just watch. Cadence uses her magical love beams to fix Shining Armor, who then makes the spell that hits the reset button. They don't bother capturing Chrysalis as Team Rocket blasts off again. Boy, good thing she was standing near a window. Who's it's and what's her face tie the knot before Dashy pulls off a sonic rain boom, against gravity no less, and we all live stupidly ever after, blissfully ensconced in a thick cloud of cognitive dissonance to the fact that we didn't actually learn anything. And as for the bad guy and her purpose? Well, my guess is you'll never hear from her again. Dude! What are you talking about? What? What do you mean? You think you don't get it, but how could you not? Isn't it obvious? I uh, beg your pardon? It's all an allegory for love. The love that conquers all. Cadence's love heals shining armor and gave him the strength to dispel the bad guy who tricked him. See, folks like Chrysalis who don't really understand love and treat it as something we use like a tool to cheat people will always be found out in the end. It's the love of friends and family that give us the strength to defeat them. That's the moral. Oh, what moral? That love is good? Sure. Isn't that great? Well, of course it's great, but we already know that love is good. But see, here's the thing. I can't shoot great streaming jets of it out of my forehead. And therefore, I'm completely at a loss as to see how it was supposed to have saved the day. If there's an allegory here, I'm struggling to see it. Is there a meaning behind this strange metaphysical representation of love? 
I'll show you what I mean. See, we're told at the start of part two that love is a tangible thing, similar to electricity, which can be physically stolen and actually used against people like a weapon. Right. This doesn't make any literal sense in the real world, but it does make metaphorical sense if, like you say, Chrysalis is an allegory for shady people who curry the affections of decent folk for selfish reasons, etc. And that's a good thing. I want to see that on TV. I mean, how do you deal with people like that? Well, according to this delightful episode, the all-encompassing power of true love will somehow save you from them, blah, blah, blah. But if that's so, then firstly, when Chrysalis squared off against the princess with the power of Lurb, then what was Celestia running on? Duracells? What was Her Highness even trying to do here? For what is this scene a metaphor? That love can defeat God? But God is love, right? All this scene proves is that Celestia isn't God. Thanks. Thanks for that. And my final word on that matter, imagine for a moment if in C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, we get to the part where Aslan sacrifices himself to the White Witch, and that's it. She wins. The end. Remove all theological illusion from this story and that's what you'd get. Come to think of it, the whole adventure probably wouldn't exist. That and The Lord of the Rings and a whole bunch of other great fiction. Can you maybe now see how this might rub some people the wrong way? And lastly, what is this scene supposed to be? Hey, whoa, what do you mean? That one's a no-brainer. Do tell. It's the part where Cadence's mercy and tenderness gives her beloved the power to defeat the villain who tricked him. It shows us that love is powerful because the people you love are there to help you when you can't or won't help yourself. That's an excellent concept. Well, bully, but if Cadence's mystical beams of glowy love radiation were able to save the day, it's only because A, Chrysalis just stands there and lets her for some baffling reason, and B, Cadence was released from prison. And how did that come to pass? Uh, because Twilight busted her out. Exactly, after being put there herself for hectoring the fake Cadence so much. <laughs> love didn't save the day, Twilight's mistrust did. <laughs> There's your moral. Kids, if you suspect someone you love has fallen prey to an emotional leech, then never stop doubting them. Oh, come on! <laughs> no, for serious. Even Princess Celestia says so. This is your victory as much as theirs. You persisted in the face of doubt, and your actions led to your being able to bring the real Princess Cadence back to us. Learning to trust your instincts is a valuable lesson to learn. Hmm, now where have I heard that before? I feel like such a fool. Well, he fooled almost everyone, but there was one little boy who never lost his mistrust. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Aw, isn't it just magical? <laughs> okay, so maybe it's not about love, but isn't this kind of a good moral too? Y well, you got me there! Good, now every pony shut up and dance! anything? How about everything? Where have you been, you recalcitrant benef- Out, you pompous pimpling plot hole! <sighs> Thank you! That's it! It's over! The series is broken and I'm going home! It's ingenious. <sighs> I'm gonna- stand here for like 20 seconds to give you a chance to carefully explain to me how how is it ingenious are you familiar with the silmarillion well i better be by now but yes yes i am what about it tolkien's unfinished history of middle earth and the universe of af featured a classic example of the battles between good and evil after creating the world the holy father uru sent his angels the valar to rule over it including melkor the one to fall Melkor was an evil, jealous tyrant who wrought nothing but chaos, and who would be defeated by the Valar many times and eventually captured. Okay, but what's this got to do with- Eventually he was released and found his way back into polite company after Eon spent in prison. Feigning repentance, he once again lived among the Valar of Arman, where he hatched an evil plan to steal the light of the world and violently betray his brethren. Oh, I get it. Chrysalis steals love, the light of the world. The secret fire against which dark fire will not avail you, flame of Udun. <laughs> right. Okay, but... But, in the Cimmerillion, he did not bamboozle God, but the Valar. 
is angels who created the power of Ea and set the sun in the sky in an age of legend before the dawn of man, much like the kingdom of heaven before the creation of earth. Where these angelic beauties live and learn? Now, who would have the power to commit such heinous treachery? Did you not recall the legend? But a trusted loved one of their own ilk, outwardly sweet, but inside the maker of all darkness? Did you not see the signs? To be later expelled from paradise, not by God or Iru, but by a lesser Vala, a lesser angel? She's definitely the Saint Michael of the group. Ah, right. Wait, we're still talking about Chrysalis, right? So, if a question contains such a character, then it is someone who is most dear to his lord, as Lucifer was to God before the war. Family? And would need to know that if forced to face the elements of harmony, that they would have no effect? If the elements of harmony could cure Princess Luna of her evil instantly... I know who you are. Why did she need to be locked in the moon for a thousand years? Some pony with the extensive knowledge of the castle and the caves beneath it? You're the mayor in the moon! Could cure Princess Luna of her evil... 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 evil. Wait. Wait. And who could that be? Nightmare Moon. <laughs> Perhaps a shapeshifter? Who then dramatically reveals herself as the evil unnamed ruler of the changelings. She's a changeling. Later revealed as Queen Christmas. You know who you are. Why? Later revealed as Princess Luna. Does my crown no longer come? She lives in the same place at the same time as anyone. It has been a thousand years since I've seen never hear from her again. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convince the world she didn't exist. And then like that, she's gone. Yep. Well, that's just one interpretation. But <laughs> it's glorious! Yeah, more like the show got pushed back to the end of the run and they just kind of had to belt this one out in a hurry. The epic struggle between heaven and hell. And deadlines. Of course the elements of harmony aren't going to change Luna's mind. They didn't change her mind the last time. <laughs> what, she spends a thousand years in angry exile planning her revenge only to be cheated out of at the last minute? Nah. She's in recon mode, biding her time, playing possum, and now she knows she can take on the elements of harmony, the dunderheaded Cantalot guard, shining armor, shield magic, and her sister, and she did it all without revealing herself to anyone. Or it was just horrible writing. Studio B, you crafty devils, you had me going there for a minute, but now it's all clear. You're planning the grand battle of heaven, where good first triumphs over evil. Right. Where St. Michael defeats Satan and claims her crown as a true princess of heaven. Uh-huh. It's the only way it makes any sense! It's the only way it makes any sense, and it's probably not true. It is ingenious! There's no pony god. Yeah!